In the Old Testament, there is a, 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 a great boon, blessing, called shalom. When you have shalom in your life, you prosper. Your bodies prosper, your finances prosper, your, your whole being prosper. That's the word shalom. It comes from the word pay, payment, shalem. So when you say peace to someone, don't forget, it is paid for. And who paid for it is our Lord Jesus. At the cross, he said, Ani me shalom. I'm, I'm paying for your peace. I'm paying for this lady's uh, uh, prosperity and blessing in her marriage. Amen. amen. It's all paid for. You can have a good amen. So the way to grow in grace and the way to grow in favor and shalom and health and peace, in uh, 2 Peter 1 it says, grace and peace be multiplied. How many want it to be multiplied? Even shalom, health, be multiplied. Grace, be multiplied to you through the knowledge or in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The only way to increase shalom and grace in our lives is not to do more, but to see more. See more of Jesus. Know more of Jesus. And the Bible says, in the knowledge of Jesus, our God and Lord, grace and peace is multiplied. Can I have a good amen? Now, the Bible calls us living stones. Look at this in 1 Peter 2. Coming to Jesus as to a living stone. So first and foremost, Jesus is a living stone. All right? Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. In Israel, back in Jesus' time, they will say a stone that you see outside, a stone in the quarry, is not a living stone. It's just stone. When does it become living stone? When you take it out of the quarry, you shape it, you cut it, you chisel it, you put it into a, a, a certain function of the building, and when it is on top of another stone and serving its function, now it is a living stone. That's how the temple of God is built up of, living stones. So coming to Jesus, he's the living stone, all right, rejected indeed by man. That's very sad, you know, that's true. The Bible says, those who don't have eyes to, to see Jesus, rejected Him, but chosen by God and precious. Now you also, all of us, as living stones, so because Jesus is the church, we are all small stones from Him. The same life that's in Him has been imparted to us. If you believe on Christ, you are a living stone built up, look at this, are being built up a spiritual house to contain God. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I remember when I was in Israel, one of the things I wanted to do, which is not too far from my hotel, was there is a rock quarry, a stone quarry, where I heard that uh, in that stone quarry, you can still see the chisel marks of the builders carving, all right, chiseling uh, stones, usually it's rectangular shape, of different sizes from that rock quarry for the building of the temple in Jerusalem. I'm about to show you a real quick video of that time when we were inside there. Follow me, look up here, all right? Can you see, this is where, some places you have to really bend down, they cut from the walls of this. Can you see that? There's a stone here that's left. Can you see all the chisel marks? This is where all the stones were taken from, all right? They flattened the top. Can you see all those shapes? There, another place where the stone was taken out from, they, they cuffed it, they took it out. And some were left two-thirds done. See, like this. They carved it into shape, but then they left it there. For some reason, they didn't like it, all right? And they left it there. But the rest, you saw the empty, empty uh, uh, ridges, all those empty space, but the shape can still, that's you and I out of it. I want to share with you how God will bring you out and God will shape you God will cut away the unnecessary parts in your life. Now, God doesn't do it with sickness and disease. Always remember that. But nonetheless, the process is painful. Sometimes God will use people to come and tell you things. How, how does God, you know, not just stones, but God, God, God says, I'm bringing you to a land, the land of Israel, where you will, you will dig copper from the mountains. You didn't have this in Egypt, but you have this in the land that I'm bringing you, God says. So that copper will later on be melted, amen, in clay molds in the plains of Jordan and become a pillar in the temple of God called Yakin and Boaz, the entrance of the pillar of the temple of Solomon. And God says in the book of Revelation that the overcomer, he that overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. So some people become pillars, pillars of bronze. Some people are just stones. 
And it's all right because all of us are living stones, but there are some that God will make a pillar. And I think that there are some I'm speaking to today, God will make you a pillar. Not just a stone, but a pillar, a pillar. And the Bible says that in Galatians, Paul himself says that about Peter, James, and John, Paul himself says that they are pillars in the church. Are you listening, people? I want to talk to you about Peter. Peter was a stone. When Jesus first met Peter, it was actually Andrew, Peter's brother, that brought Peter to Jesus. All right, he, he found his own brother Simon and said, we have found the Messiah, which is the Christ. Drop down. He brought him to Jesus. When Jesus looked at Simon, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Kephas, which is translated a stone. Can you see it? Now, here is where we would call his conversion took place. It's possible to be converted and not be consecrated. In other words, you're just saved. You go to church on Sunday, but it doesn't really thrill you, your purpose, where you're supposed to be in the house of God, where you're supposed to function in, you don't care. So Peter was like that. He was a fisherman. He says, okay, good, he's the Messiah, I'm going fishing. So the Bible tells us that Jesus still had to cultivate him. Jesus brought him out of the darkness by the revelation of who he is, the Messiah. And now, Jesus has more work to do on him. And he was, he was one day by the lake of Galilee and he was washing his nets. And the Bible says the multitude pressed upon Jesus. Jesus looked behind him. There were two boats there, the Bible says. Remember, say two. He could have gone in either one of them. But the Bible says, Jesus stepped into the one that belonged to Simon. And Jesus says to Simon, launch out into the deep. Let's go to the deep. And, and by the way, they worked all night already and they caught nothing. And Jesus says, Let, go, down, go into the deep, Simon. Let's go. And drop down your nets, plural, for a big catch. And Peter was watching. Peter looked, Master, we worked all night. We caught nothing. He needed a greater revelation of Jesus. You know, and he went with Jesus because he said this, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net, singular. So you can say he obeyed. Yeah, he obeyed, but not completely full. Jesus says, let down the nets, plural, a lot of nets. He says, all right, we'll go and we'll let down the net. And the Bible says they enclosed so much fish that they cannot take the fish into the boat. They had to call for help from their partners. And the Bible says when they came, the partners came to carry that, you know, that heavy swollen net into the boat, the boat began to sing. And the Bible says at this point, Simon fell at Jesus' feet, at his knees. The Bible tells you where, and grabbed his knees and said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. And I don't know why Hollywood wants to change God's word. You know, but he says, depart from me. Something happened to him. Church, it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. You see, he didn't repent first and then Jesus gave him the, the catch of fish. Jesus blessed him first and that drove him to repentance. And finally, they were at the foot of the mount and Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And some of them say, Jeremiah. Some say, John the Baptist. Then Jesus looked at all the disciples and said, who do you say I am? Peter answered, look at this. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon Berjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. You know, you know what it means? That means what? Ain't no way you got this from yourself. And then the Bible said, drop down. From that time, Jesus began to show. By the way, this is the first time Jesus talk, started talking about his sufferings and death to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. So he's talking about his sufferings and his death. Next verse. Then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me for you're not mindful of the things of God but the things of men. All in the same breath, he just received praise. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Then he started feeling. <laughs> Blessed. <laughs> and brought Jesus and re rebuked Jesus. <laughs> now some people, when you give them a position, all of a sudden they forget where they came from. 
still to come today. Grace is different. Grace abounds where there's greatest failure. Stay tuned. Joseph Prince will be right back. God wants to meet your every need. Rise above every situation of lack and enjoy His supply as you learn about His great love for you. As a thank you for your gift of any amount, receive Joseph's latest two-sermon audio series, Ask Big, God Loves to Give. It's time to experience a new level of God's goodness in your life. For a specific gift, we'll send you a special package that includes the brand new My Prayer Journal and other resources. Gear up for an amazing 2015 with this journal as you pin your hopes and prayers to God and have your faith ignited through inspirational verses and quotes. God wants to bless you beyond what you can ask or think. To order these resources, call us toll free at 1-877-769-5433 or visit us at josephprince.org today. But let's go right now to the Last Supper. And Jesus said this in Luke 22. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan, indeed Satan has asked for you. Can you imagine if, if the Lord tells you Satan has asked for you? There's something about Peter, Simon Peter, that has a red carpet for the devil. Maybe his quickness to say things. And Jesus is telling Peter, all right, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. You know they have a sieve where they, the, they, they sift the, the raw wheat into fine flour. That's what Satan wants to do. But I've prayed for you. Listen, long before the devil comes with his temptations and his attacks, Jesus has prayed for you. Jesus has prayed for your children. Are you listening, people? That's what he's doing at the Father's right hand. I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. He didn't say that you will not fail because we know that Peter failed. But your faith will not fail. Some things you will go through, the sifting, because there's something in you that needs to be sifted. But Satan knows, all right, his legal rights in the sense, but Jesus says he's bound by me. He cannot go any further. I will allow you to fail, but not your faith. And faith is your eye on Jesus. Are you listening, people? All right? And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So long before he fell, Jesus prophesied his return and his ministry of strengthening his brethren. Now, if Jesus says this to you, what will your response be? Jesus, I did not trust myself. Please. Lord, lay your hands on me, Lord. Impart your grace, your strength, right? Immediately after this, verse 32, verse 33, but Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I am ready. I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Now, is that the kind of response you would expect someone to have? I am ready. And Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you're denied. Three times you know me. Hmm? This took place in the upper room. All right, drop down. Having, okay, we are going to the Garden of Gethsemane. No more in the upper room. We are now in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus has prayed, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And having arrested Jesus, they led Jesus and brought him to the high priest's house. Many of you have been there, Caiaphas' house. All right? But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. All right? It was uh, towards the end of spring. It's very, very cold at night. If you're in Israel, you know what I'm talking about. At the end of spring. Peter sat among them. Next verse. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied Jesus, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Next. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. Peter said, I am, man, I'm not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him. He's a Galilean. You can tell by the accent. The next verse. 
But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Another gospel says, he cursed and swear he does not know Jesus. All in the same night, or I should say morning now. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I don't believe it's a look that says, there, you failed me again. I think it's a look of Peter, hold steady. You will return to me. And when you return to me, strengthen your other brothers. I love you. I have to go through this. Ani Meshalem. Amen. And the Bible tells us when Jesus rose from the dead, amen, some women came, three of them, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Salome, or Mary the mother of James and, and Salome came to the tomb early in the morning. And the Bible says that they saw the large stone was rolled away. And the Bible says they saw a young man sitting on the, on the, on the right side. And he said to them, he's there as a messenger. After Jesus rose from the Jesus, Jesus left a message to the young, to the angel, I should say, all angels are young. And this is the message. Don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. By the way, I must let you know that on the same day, Jesus rose from the dead. After he said that through the angel, Jesus met Peter. We know this from Luke 24. Jesus has appeared to Simon. So whatever happened there, the Bible says it's clouded with a veil. Nobody has an opportunity. God doesn't want anyone to be there when the Lord restores him. Amen. But what you see one week later is a restoration into ministry. When again all night they caught nothing and finally Jesus says, throw your net on the right side. They saw Jesus by the beach and they caught so much fish. John realized it was Jesus and Peter jumped into the water to go to Jesus. He was restored already. And when breakfast was finished, oh, they, as soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals there, fish laid on bread. So there's fire and charcoal. The smell of charcoal fire is very distinctive. Peter probably smelt it and reminded him when he sat at the fire of charcoals and denied knowing the Lord. The Lord is healing him now so that every time he sees charcoal fire, he won't think of his failure. He will think of the Lord's love. And Jesus made breakfast. The reason Jesus, he's not so high and glorified that he cannot make breakfast. Ladies, I know you are spirit-filled, speaking in tongues. Can you make breakfast? You keep the house clean, amen? The reason Jesus made breakfast for his disciples. Bring some of the fish you have caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. The net wasn't, was not broken. I think the Holy Spirit purposely want to say that now. <laughs> Next verse. Come and eat breakfast, Jesus said. No one asked, who are you? Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and likewise the fish. He's still serving. He's still serving. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised. Next verse. We'll close with this. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than this? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. When they had eaten breakfast, I'll tell you something. Before the Lord tells you to do something, whether it's feed his lambs or whatever, he'll make sure you have eaten first. I'm talking spiritually. Do you understand or not? He never places a demand until you are filled. When they had eaten breakfast, then he said, Simon, because Simon boasted, just a few nights before. Even if everyone forsake you, I'll never forsake you. One gospel says that. Even if all this, all these disciples put together forsake you, I'll never forsake you. Now Jesus is saying, do you love me more than all this? And the word Jesus used is agapao, which is actually the highest form of love, self-sacrificial love. Peter answered. Peter learned his lesson. Peter says, no, Lord, I, I, he didn't use agapao. I like you. Filio. In your English, you can't see it. Peter said, I, 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 I'm just fond of you. No more that boastful. Based on that, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, feed my lambs. Still trusted him. Then Jesus asked again, second time, Peter, do you love me? Do you agapao me, the highest form of love? Peter says, Lord, you know, 
I feel you owe you. I'm fond of you. I like you, but not to the extent of giving my life. At that level, Jesus says, shepherd my sheep. And the third time Jesus asked, Peter, do you love me? Again, by the way, the third time, Jesus changed. Jesus came to Peter's level and says, Peter, do you feel you owe me? Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know that my love for you is, I've learned my lesson. It's only at the point of filio. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. What is the greatest thing to his heart before he leaves to go to the Father? His sheep. And who did he entrust his sheep to? To a man who fell denying, cursing and swearing that he knew, he did not know Jesus. Wow. Where sin increased, grace superabounds. If I was there, I will appoint somebody who never deny me. Someone who is faithful all the way. John, James, even Bato. But, not Bart Simpson, Bartolomeo. I appoint Bartolomeo. How do you hear about Bartolomeo? Not even a Mew. But grace is different. Grace abounds where there's greatest failure. So that he's, and one, of, one day, Peter would rise up on the day of Pentecost. Of all the disciples, it was Peter who preached a sermon. I'm not afraid of the Jews anymore. These are the people, some of them, they were there when he denied knowing Jesus. He preached to them and said, you killed the Messiah, the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead. And they were cut to their heart, the Bible says, and 3,000 people were saved at Peter's preaching. He became a pillar. And that's how he's going to love you. And that's how he's loving you today. Sometimes there's correction. Sometimes it comes through the mouth of someone, even your spouse or your friend. Sometimes even for your enemies. Allow yourself to be cultivated. And if you should fall, if you should fall, it is not the end. He's there to pick you up. And he will say, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Church, this is your savior. This is our Lord. How beautiful he is. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast. You have watched highlights of a sermon by Joseph Prince.